Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world you've joined us from today. Welcome to uh, the concurrent session on the role of philanthropy in fighting pandemics. This session is part of the Global Health Symposium, which is being hosted by Texas Biomed. And I'm joined here today, I'm really excited to be joined here today by a group of esteemed panelists, Sam Mayer from the N Fund, Chantelle Wilkins from the Konkowski Foundation. Um, we have Brian Castrucci from the Beaumont Foundation and Todd Jacobson from the NBA. I'm gonna start off um, just so you know uh, how uh, excellent our panelists are today. I'm gonna start off with uh, introducing them by reading their bios. So Chantelle Wilkins is the Deputy Managing Director of the Konkowski Char Charitable Foundation. She is an advocate and supporter of an inclusive culture where differences are leveraged. She welcomes uncomfortable conversations that will address and remedy institutional racism and racial and gender bias. Other areas in which she serves her community include childhood education, nonprofit capacity building, and science and technology. Chantel serves as the Deputy Managing Director of the Konkowski Foundation, a regional foundation investing in initiatives in, in the state of Texas. And she's been in this position since 2019. Welcome to the panel, Chantel. Thank Next you, Akuda. Will, thank you. Next, I will introduce Todd Jacobson. Todd Jacobson is a Senior Vice President of Social Responsibility for the National Basketball Association, the NBA. He oversees the NBA, the w, WNBA, the NBA G League, and the NBA 2K League social responsibility efforts uh, and their community partnerships and public service initiatives. He also directs the league's government affairs, including the White House and State Department relationships managing the league's communications and engagement. Since joining the NBA in 2000, Jacobson has managed uh, uh, and launched the execution of the NBA CARES platform, led the development of the NBA's international community outreach initiatives, and created the community relations program for the NBA. Welcome to the panel, Todd. Um, Sam Mayer is Vice President of Public Affairs for the N Fund. Sam is, um, he is responsible for the organization's global external engagement, including advocacy and communications, that advance the neglected tropical diseases and attract additional resources and attention for the NTD sector. Sam leads the N Fund's efforts uh, to mobilize a growing ecosystem for NTD champions across governments uh, and the pharmaceutical industry and a coalition of other cultural, private sector and community-based organizations. Previously, uh, Sam was the Executive Director International Programs for the Mac AIDS Fund where he oversaw a grant portfolio that supported 130 HIV AIDS service uh, organizations across 50 countries. Welcome to the panel, Sam. And last but not least, Dr. Brian Pestrucci, president and CEO of the Beaumont Foundation is here with us today. Uh, he is a disruptor, instigator and fierce advocate for public health an award-winning epidemi epidemiologist with 10 years of experience working in the state and local health departments. He brings a unique background to the philanthropic sector that allows him to shape and implement visionary and practical initiatives and partnerships and bring together research and practice to improve public health. Under his leadership, the Beaumont Foundation is driving change to improve population health foster collaboration between public and public health and primary care, and strengthen the nation's public health infrastructure. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. It's great to have you all here today. We're having a crucial conversation about the role of philanthropy in fighting pandemics. Um, this is an important conversation today. Uh, because we all know that um, institutions that are philanthropic across the globe are repositioning, repurposing to meet the moment, uh, the moment of COVID. So it's great to have you all here to help us tackle some important um, questions around 
what philanthropic organizations should do, given that our world has changed, given that uh, we have seen a, uh, a major disruptor in COVID, which we're all trying to respond to, and we need the tools to do so. So without further ado, I'd like to ask each of my panelists today, if you could each think about this and, and tell me uh, what you'd like to share regarding what your organization is doing slightly differently uh, in fighting pandemics, and what is a really important point you'd like to get out before we um, begin going into some other detailed questions. So what is it that your organization um, is doing? What would you like to share about your organization? And uh, what's a really important point you'd like to start this panel discussion off with? And I'd like to start with you, Chantel. Great, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, first, I'd like to share that this year we are celebrating 25 years. It's not quite 80, um, like Texas Biomed, so happy 80th anniversary. But in those 25 years, we've invested over $300 million in the counties we serve, Bandera, Bear, Comal, and Kendall counties. We have a diverse group uh, staff here of 10 people, and we get a lot done uh, with our amazing staff. And one of the things that's important about this foundation, and there's a couple of things that we're about. We're about convening collaboration for both funders and nonprofits. We're about building trust so that grantees see us as a partner and not as an authoritative figure. We have to meet them where they're at. We're also about taking an active role in changing the narrative for those in our communities that seek assistance. Uh, one of our grantees recently just launched a rebrand, and they came out with some very key points when they talked to the populations that they served. And they, the populations told them that we should stop using the terms below the poverty line and low income and to remove the stigma around poverty as a shame. And that the terms we need to start using are undervalued communities and financially underserved. And as far as our role in fighting the pandemic, we have not changed our strategy. Uh, thankfully, our managing director, Tullis Wells, often says, and it's quite true here, the blessing of the Albert and Bessie May Kronkowski Charitable Foundation is our ability to be nimble in addressing the needs of the counties we serve, whether it's through our traditional grant making or through our initiatives. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, I, I, I noted some themes here of trust and partnership. Um, and I think this is a common thread to, through some of the discussions we had earlier today when we had uh, Barbara Pierce Bush uh, speak to our CEO, Dr. Schlesinger. In that conversation, a heavy emphasis there was trust, building partnerships that, um, that do inspire the trust of people so that you can get things done. And trust is a foundation really for, for being able to be effective. Um, I'd like to move on to you, Todd, if you could take a stab at Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think when you're thinking about the pandemic, it's been the year like no other for all of us. And um, it continues to be something where we're continuing to listen and learn as we go. Um, you know, for the NBA particularly, um, you know, we very publicly stopped playing our games in early March last year uh, when one of our players tested positive uh, prior to the start of the game. Um, that game was on television and we had to move very, very quickly as an organization to react. Um, and, and that's what we, we did. And we, we wanted to make sure working with health officials that we were able to do that. Within two weeks of that announcement of our hiatus of our season, uh, we launched something called MBA Together. Um, and the idea there was to really leverage our strength in the technology sector, um, but also trying to create connection points during a time when there was so much uncertainty. Um, and we did that in four ways. The first was to really promote health and safety through our channels. And I, and I share this knowing that I'm talking to the health community here today we did, in our first two weeks, we did public service announcements, really just about getting out information. There's so much misinformation out there today where people are consuming information is changing. And we just wanted to use our channels as a way to amplify those voices that needed to be heard, whether it be the CDC, the World Health Organization, local health officials, to make sure that people had the right information of what they needed to do. Um, our PSA has got over 65 million views just on our assets. And so the, the advantages of using the sports community and entertainment community to do that, I think is very valuable. Um, and those partnerships can really bear a lot of fruit, um, but particularly in terms of shining a light on, on organizations and where people can go for the right information. Second piece we did is really try to create a community where people can get together. Um, during this time, virtual learning and, and engagement with families, people really didn't know what to go about doing. And, and clearly there was 
a lot of equity issues in terms of getting resources and support. But we wanted to put out a lot of um, information about health and wellness and things people can do at home. We've created live programming on social media channels, again, using our vast reach around the world to try to reach as many people as possible with ways in which they can do things at home and stay active and healthy. And so we really try to focus on that. As the pandemic uh, moved forward, we really focused on a lot of the inequity that was really come on. I think we all saw it, both it's, it's certainly a global issue, but, but you're seeing it a lot here in the United States as well. Um, that really came into a lot of our social justice issues that really it's all interconnected together. Uh, we launched uh, two new entities during this time, one an MBA foundation with a $300 million commitment to really making sure we're empowering the economic, uh, the economic stability of the black community, uh, focusing on education, uh, focusing on employment and career advancement. So we're really looking at 14 to uh, 24 age range and kind of those key periods of times when you're engaging youth first, their first job, you know, whether they're making that transition from school to their career. And then more importantly, once you get on your career, making sure that you can continue to navigate that important piece, but also looking at the systemic nature of inequity that exists in the system and what we can do to contribute to combat that as well. The, the last thing I'll share is we started a coalition, uh, a coalition really focused on advocacy and legislation. What we saw during this time, we saw it through civic engagement and a number of ways we were able to bring that to life. But that sports community in particular, uh, we had an outsized influence of really being able to influence uh, change and getting people to get engaged. And we thought that was really important and we wanted to continue to do that as an MBA family. And so we launched a coalition with a focus on, on voting and police and criminal justice reform. Again, looking at it as a nonpartisan situation where we really wanna make sure that we're supporting legislation that engages people, that supports positive change and, and things that we can do. And I think that continues to be really important for us. So a lot has shifted in the sports community and the business community in general. And, and that's the point I would make uh, to everyone here. I think you know, coming from the business community, there, there's really, it's an inflection point that we're all facing between you know, maximizing bottom, uh, the, the, the bottom line and your profits and the betterment of society and how, how much alignment is, exists there. It's the rise of stakeholder capitalism is important and, and crisis breeds innovation. We've seen this kind of accelerate through the pandemic. And I think you're gonna continue to see that with the business community. And there's a real opportunity here for the other sectors to bring them involved and use the resources and support the business community has to really combat a lot of the issues that we're facing today. Thank you so much, Todd. That's very powerful. You all um, have done quite a bit. It sounds like redirecting, um, you know, creating a new pool of funding that you know, was really um, directed at the black community, uh, but also using your platform to engage people in such a way that um, they will listen. And that's, that's real innovation there because people plug into sports, uh, people trust, there's some trust really that goes with the sports community. And it's a great way, I think, um, to get people to listen in because there's the power that comes with and the platform that comes with sports. So thanks for sharing that. Now, um, I'm gonna move to you, uh, Brian. Uh, Todd just shared with us that crisis or crises breed innovation. Um, how is the, uh, the Beaumont um, Foundation uh, reacted to this? What is it that you'd like to share about um, your foundation, what you all are doing? And secondly, um, you know, what's a really important point you want to make as it relates to this conversation? So we've always been working to help communities achieve their optimal health by working on policy, developing partnerships, and most importantly, supporting the public health workforce. And that's what we're going to keep doing because this is an event that is playing out against a, a larger backdrop. And that backdrop is the continued defunding of public health. So we always knew that a global pandemic was a win. It was never an if. And our response with this knowledge was to cut public health. Not once, not twice, but repeatedly. So imagine if, if a foreign nation, imagine if China parked an aircraft carrier off the coast of Georgia and our response was to cut the military. We wouldn't do that, but we knew that this was coming. We, we, Bill Gates, you know, others, health leaders had predicted this. And so what we're committed to is to make sure that we build a robust public health system. Because if, if one of the lessons that COVID has taught us is that our continued safety 
security, and economic prosperity is dependent on a robust public health system? And are we going to close the vulnerabilities that existed that allowed for COVID's devastation in the US, or are we gonna to continue to ignore those vulnerabilities and move forward? In a very short term, what we've done is work on messaging and working on you know, getting the right messages from the right messengers, because if we do that, we can save lives. We're working right now on how to promote better vaccine confidence, We've created um, the Public Health Communications Collaborative, which you can find at publichealthcollaborative.org, which is um, a platform that we're using to push out good messages and um, infographics and things that health departments can use. Because you know, I, I love that Todd like mentioned local health officials. That's amazing. Uh, but a lot of those local health officials don't have a communications budget or a communications person, right, to actually make the infographics they need to communicate effectively with the public. Um, we've also created the Health Action Alliance, which is a group of businesses led by the Ad Council, Business Roundtable, CDC Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and De Beaumont to try to engage businesses in the immediate need to promote vaccine, but then after that, to support public health and to help our nation understand that we have to invest in our public health infrastructure, or we remain vulnerable. So I, I also want to encourage everyone to go check out um, changingthecovidconversation.org. That, that's where we are uh, putting all of our messaging and there's everything there um, from how to in interact with different communities. We have a very special focus right now on working on vaccine concern among Republican voters and have worked with Frank Lentz, the Republican pollster on messaging to that community. So um, that's what we've been doing. But, you know, my the one point I want to make is it's all public health. You know, we don't think about it a lot, but we lost 550,000 American lives so far. And we've lost 100,000 businesses. Right. No one like when has the NBA ever stopped playing the games? And that wasn't because of a war. That wasn't because of a, 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 of a, of a terrorist incident. That was because of a virus. And our nation has been preparing for a war for a very long time, but we're preparing for the wrong war because no foreign nation has ever taken 550,000 American lives on American soil. So that's 700 billion that goes to defense every year. I think that's great, but we need to find some money to fund public health. Not here's some money for one time. It needs to be part of our basic fundamental fabric of our nation. Great. Thank you, Brian. Underscoring the importance of advocacy for public health, also underscoring the importance of information, education, communication, behavioral change, advocacy, um, really critical. And, and so thanks for sharing that. Quite related, Sam, um, you're with the N Fund, and we know that you all focus on neglected tropical diseases. And so by their very name or um, and nature, they don't get a lot of advocacy. So I'm curious, what is your organization? What's the fund doing differently during the pandemic? And also, what would you like to share? What's your message as we go into this conversation? Thank you, Kudo. And I, I would echo a lot of Brian's comments. I, I think you know th those comments were made in, in relation primarily to the United States and the health system here, but they echo equally around the world. Um, so the END Fund is a leading collaborative philanthropic fund. We're dedicated to ending the five most common neglected tropical diseases, although there are 20. Um, these uh, include things like intestinal worms, schistosomiasis, uh, trachoma, and 1.7 billion people in the world need treatment for at least one of these diseases. So we're talking 20% of the global population, and in Africa alone, it's 50%. So the fund... Uh, aggregates private capital and takes really a systems approach to investing in a, a variety of partners, uh, including governments directly, uh, international or local implementing partners, research institutes and advocacy organizations locally, depending on the country context and always in service of, of the country's own needs goals around disease elimination. Um, I, I think great progress has been made. I mean, of that 1.7 billion in need, um, 
Now, annually, a billion people are accessing treatment and 43 countries have eliminated at least one neglected disease, which is incredible progress. But nevertheless, we're faced with the fact that 700 million people or so uh, need treatment and aren't accessing it. These treatments are are donated. It costs less than 50 cents per person per year to, to deliver these donated treatments. And yet it's not happening at, at the scale it needs to. Um, and unfortunately, the people who are continue to, to not access these services, um, they are the furthest from access to any health services in the world. Um, you know, and, and that is not going to change. They're going to remain uh, vulnerable to neglected tropical diseases, to COVID-19 and a host of other uh, diseases unless something significant changes. Um, and I think really the, the main point I would want to get across here is that the thing that needs to change is that eliminating infectious disease shouldn't just be seen as, as the right thing to do uh, socially or even morally. Um, it really is an economic imperative. Um, you know, decision makers from outside of the health sector need to understand this and I think feel incentivized to invest in health in new ways. Um, they need to see a return, be able to imagine a return on that investment that aligns with their own goals and their own programs. Um, you know, a helpful common denominator for this, I think, can be how well educated, experienced and productive and, and, and healthy a labor force is. Um, but this is directly impacted with how well we are doing in tackling inf infectious disease. Um, you know, I think never before has philanthropy been more important than it is now. Uh, in, in the midst of a global pandemic, seeing the, the fragility and the, the over-reliance on, on government aid funding and a system that is stagnant and and, you know, unsustainable. Um, philanthropists in the private sector can play a huge role by funding and incentivizing the, the kinds of innovation and partnership that we've started to hear a little bit about um, that are really required to move beyond the status quo in, in global health, which is, you know, rooted in systemic problems of racism, disincentives, inefficiency across the board. Um, you know, I, I think the key element here is around incentives and, and you know, shared value and the right kinds of, of new creative partnerships, which I think the private sector can really help to push the envelope on and is something that, you know, traditional bilateral government funding has, has significantly lacked. Thank you so much, Sam. I, you know, I want to stay, stay with that for a moment and just dig a little bit deeper. Can you shed some light on, on the specific differences you see between government funding and private sector slash philanthropy? And also where you see, uh, what are you concerned about regarding government funding and the way we fund public health? If we could just rest with this topic um, for a bit before we move on. Sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I think the obvious differences are this, and we've heard a little bit about this already, the speed, the agility, the, the risk tolerance uh, that private uh, funders have as compared to governments is, is a, you know, these are key differentiators, especially in a crisis response uh, and, and, you know, in relation to, to breaking the status quo. Um, we do see greater degrees of unrestricted funding coming from private sources uh, over governments where trust levels are there. But I, I do want to emphasize that this is an area that philanthropy and the private sector still have a huge way to go in, in terms of uh, building that trust. Um, you know, I, I think... Of course, donors need to be educated and gain their own expertise on, on the issues that they want to fund and, and contribute to, but they shouldn't be doing so to restrict or to control funding from a, a, a position that it, they're perhaps not proximate to the work itself, um, or even to presume that they know how funds may be best allocated, but to do so to know who to trust and to know how their trusted partners can really be effective arbiters of their philanthropy. Um, I mean, in the neglected tropical disease sector, we're unfortunately seeing what happens when we have an over-reliance on uh, a, you know, a, a stagnant uh, bilateral system of funding. There are only two bilateral sources of funding globally for neglected diseases. And one of them is the UK, who just late, late last week slashed the vast majority of its global health funding. And overnight, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that hundreds of millions of lives around the world uh, are imperiled as a result. I mean, the lives, the, the well-being, the livelihoods of people are directly affected by these decisions. And, you know, this is one country making one decision. So the, 
that there's there's an imbalance there that I think that the private sector and philanthropy can really step into. Um, I mean, we have pharmaceutical companies I mentioned before who have generously donated drugs for distribution, yet as a result of uh, cutting government funding, uh, they're going to have to scramble to ensure their products are not wasted. And, you know, thankfully, we're starting to see some philanthropists and companies start to ask the right questions about how in the short term they can help to limit the damage caused by the, this kind of fragility in the system. But also, I think in the longer term, how they can incentivize the right partnerships and, and drive the right kinds of innovation and learning and integration across sectors that is going to have to be part of the solution going forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. Chantel, I'm going to come back to you. Um, if you can shed some light on how philanthropy in your, uh, from your perspective is changing uh, through this pandemic or through the last one year, and uh, also what lessons are we learning and what do we need to do differently as we move forward? Oh, great question. So philanthropy through this pandemic, uh, it has forced funders to loosen. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, Sam mentioned it, their purse strings and allow organizations to use the dollars what they needed it for. They have initially funded for sponsorships or other things, but allowed organizations to use those toward operations, which is what they needed in a time to serve our vulnerable population. So you've seen that shift and they became more nimble. That has to continue. There has to continue to be some flexibility and funders have to be willing to fund the non-flashy side of the nonprofit space, right? So if nonprofits can't keep the lights on, then what does it do if you're funding a program if there's no building to go to? How important is that building with your name on it if they can't pay salaries or keep the lights on? So we really have to start looking at how we fund nonprofits, but we also have to go on a listening tour. We have to meet nonprofits where they're at, find out what they need and stop telling them what we think they need. And Sam really alluded to this. We have to be willing to have conversations that are uncomfortable for them to tell us and build that trust. And we've talked about this early on. So they can let us know where they're really struggling at. And if we don't start to do this, then we're not being very helpful nonprofits by throwing money at them if it's not where if it's not going to be helpful for them to accomplish their missions. The other thing is that I've seen philanthropists and funders and Todd and the NBA has alluded to this, become more vocal. Right? They're really taking a stand. They're, they're saying, we are the leaders here. We're going to take a stand. We're going to be on the right side of history. We're going to address what's happened in the world today, and we're going to let you know what our position is when it comes to the, the issues facing us today, racial justice, inequities, healthcare disparities, all of these things. We're going to stand up. We're going to be loud about it, and we're going to tell you where we are in this position. And I think that's something that you normally didn't happen. Normally, you see funders and corporations kind of stand back and stick to the business. Well, not anymore. The pandemic has forced us to really have to pay attention. We've had to sit still and see what's really going on in our communities and we can't get caught up in the business of our day anymore. So we've had to address these things head on. One thing I think we can do post this pandemic and some lessons I think that need to stay with us as we find our new normal is we funders need to stop and take a moment and just really appreciate what the nonprofit community has done during this time the flexibility, the creativity. I mean, it, it's impressive and we need to acknowledge it and give them a, a kudos and respect for what they did to serve our vulnerable populations during this time. There's a labor shortage happening right now across the world. We've got to help as, as funders, we've got to start leading that conversation to figure out collaborative and scalable ways to reskill and upskill current workforce to fill these positions. That includes nonprofit job openings as well. Let's be, let's be clear. Nonprofits are small businesses and large businesses. They are a business just like anybody else, and they should be treated as such. The wealth gap is growing, and the impact, and the impact it hits everyone, just like the health care that Brian alluded to. The wealth gap impacts everybody across the board. It's not just one population that's being impacted by this. And although women have been hard by this pandemic, Akuto, women of color and women in senior leadership have been hit the hardest. And we need to acknowledge and address that and figure out ways to create wraparound services to, to address it and deal with it head on. There's a revolution happening in medicine. You guys have all alluded to it, Brian and Sam. 
it's happening right now in healthcare and medicine, and we need to be awake, we need to be paying attention, and we need to be figuring out how to provide solutions in order to move forward from that. The benefit of telemedicine has become undeniable. I mean, you look across the, the landscape, transportation across many cities and states is an issue, but telemedicine has really been able to meet people in their homes and address these issues. We've been isolated for so long. The other thing is the line between work and home, that it's gone <laughs> pretty much now. Um, we have to figure out how we move forward in a new hybrid work model from that. And then, you know, self-care, it needs to be a priority for all of us. You know, you, we talked about the medicine here. We've talked about what's going on and we have to be able to take care of ourselves in this environment because we can't help others. We don't take care of ourselves. And I want to address um, what Sam and Brian have talked about in the health industry. Social determinant of health is, is so huge right now that we've got to figure out how do we tackle what's happening and look at the wraparound services of these communities? Because it's not just about getting medicine and getting a treatment and seeing your doctor. It's about lack of food. It's about lack of transportation. There's so many indicators that, that are across the healthcare line that we need to be looking at everything as a whole. And we need to figure out where to capture, how to capture that data, and how to use it to do informed investments in our community. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, is a huge bolus of wisdom that you've thrown. I, I'm trying to digest all of that. And I, you know, I, I trust our viewers um, have been inspired by what you've just shared, Chantel. You've tackled uh, so, many, so many topics in there. Todd, were you going to say something? Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Akuto. Um, I, I did want, I mean, what Chantel said was just so powerful. I just wanted to kind of add on to it because I think just made so many excellent points that were just, are just so important for what we're all discussing here today. You know, the first piece is, and, and the word she used was learning. And I thought, I thought it was such a fat, great word and so important because I think us in the, as we looked at the business community, certainly at the NBA, looking when we're tackling issues with humility and going on these learning journeys together is so important. And what you're seeing now in this shift in the business world is business is gonna become more sophisticated in terms of how they invest in philanthropy and how they go about doing their just day-to-day -day business in general. And I think this is an important shift that you're gonna start seeing. Um, we started to see it during the pandemic. You're starting to see this rise of corporate activism start coming and, and corporations going into topics and CEOs weighing in on things they haven't traditionally done before. Um, you know, No longer is it just about the shareholders. It's gonna be about everybody kind of within the business and how they feel they can be more sustainable. This is important for the philanthropic sector, as well as the public sector to realize, because I think the business community is hungry. Businesses need to approach it with humility. Um, that is something we continue to stress. It is hard, you know, when we're competing, certainly in the sports world, uh, that is something that we have to push down and make sure we're listening and doing that. And, and one example I will say is on our WNBA, they started a social justice council. It was so powerful. The, the women of the WNBA stepped forward. And I think there has been no organization, the W, uh, that has done a better job addressing issues head on and very directly and unapologetically as, as the women of the W. And one area is around uh, uh, vaccinations for black women, uh, particularly in the U.S. They're working with the uh, black women's health imperative to do more here. This was very important for them. They said, look, most of our league out of our 144 players is made up of black women. We want to make sure we put a stand in the ground. We want to say something and we want to make sure we're taking active stance in that. It's incredibly powerful. They do that by reaching out to experts to say, how can we be supportive? What do we need to learn? Where can we use our voice? So that humility and education, that learning journey we're trying to go on is, is incredibly important on the business side. On the flip side, when I'm in the public or nonprofit sector, what I would encourage everybody to do is approach a relationship not as a revenue stream, as a donation or as a value distribution, but as a partnership, right? Businesses are trying to learn. We're trying to figure out how we use this. And it's not just about writing a check. It's about all the resources that we have to bear and how you can take advantage of that. I think too often, even when people approach the MBA, they're like, how can I get a donation for my organization or for my event that I'm hosting versus sitting down with me or our teams or having a larger conversations of this is the work we do. How does it intersect from a value-based perspective of how we can drive impact together? It's a different way of looking at it and it needs to be done more deliberately and more intentionally moving forward for, for these sectors to really kind of make sure that integration and collaboration that we're, we've seen a lot during the pandemic because of a necessity continues as we come back online more and more. I think that's gonna be critically important. So you're just really echoing what Chantal said because I think she really hit on a lot of the key points that, that we all wanted to make during this panel. 
and really encourage all of you to really kind of be very deliberate about how you're going about your business with the different sectors, how you can look at partnerships, and then more importantly, that humility and, and learning journey that we all need to go on in terms of what do we need to do as organizations, regardless of who we are, to really make a, a concerted effort to drive impact moving forward. If you can do that, you're going to be more successful in what you do overall. And I think that's what we've seen. And we think that the organizations, regardless of the sector that have done that, have had the most success during this pandemic and are the ones we're looking to of how they approach it and how we can learn from that moving forward. Uh, Thank you, John. Yeah, no, that's really, really well said. Uh, you know, Chantal, you've opened Pandora's box, and I think we're, we're all benefiting from this. I, I just want to invite you, Brian, to, to weigh in. You know, maybe we, we stay with this topic for a little bit. We're talking about um, philanthropists in the corporate space as well as in the foundation space taking a stand, weighing in on social justice issues, going into more equitable partnerships with um, non-pro the nonprofit sector, advocating for the nonprofit sector, um, you know, really trying to listen and learn from the implementers, those who are closer to the action. Uh, what do you have to say about this, Brian, and how has your institution um, plugged into this? So, so this is my yes and. So I agree with everything Chantal has said and everything Todd has said. But I want to add the, the, the policy piece. And of course, philanthropy is comfortable and has been consistent in communities. But we need to be at the Capitol, at the city council, at the county commission. You know, if, if Todd was willing, maybe he could set up a one-on-one -on -one game with me and Jason Tatum. And, and I think Jason Tatum from the Celtics will probably beat me in that one-on-one -on -one game. And so Todd's then going to come up to me and he say, listen, Brian, he just, he just beat you like 70,000 to one. Like one would even be iffy. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you new sneakers. And I think these new sneakers are going to help you win this one-on-one -on -one game. And you know what the outcome is going to be of that one-on-one -on -one game after I put on those sneakers? It's going to be 70,000 to one again. And we spend far too much time you know, changing the sneakers, changing the game pieces, and we're not changing the rules, right? The only way that I could beat Jason Tatum is if they tied both of his hands behind his back and maybe made him hop on one leg. And, and that's fine because that's how you have to change the policy level, right? How is it that we had an entire pandemic where we where the first thing we said to people, first thing we said, if you're sick, stay at home. Let me tell you, let me be straight with this. If, if you tell me to stay home and that risks my child not eating or me not paying rent, I'm going to work. Bottom line. We did, we, we engage in an exercise in contact tracing where if I give up, you know, my friend who, who I saw the other day and I'm positive and I know that that means he's going to be out of work for two weeks and his kids won't eat and there's no, I'm not, I'm not giving up that contact. You know, so we're not even creating the environment in which people can, can achieve their optimal health. We need paid sick leave. We need to have policies that, that um, provide rent, uh, provide legal assistance to those being evicted, right? Because that's the other piece. We've done a lot of rent forbearance in this pandemic. That bill is coming due. We're going to have a, an eviction crisis in this country. It should not be that just because Amazon or some other company puts their new headquarters next to your apartment building, this is not a lottery win for you. You should not be able to jack up the rent by five times because of that. There are ways that we can have capitalism. I believe in capitalism, but not uncontrolled, not predatory capitalism. And we've taken far too many of the reins off and allowed people to, to profit off of predatory behavior. That has to stop. And you know what? Those of us on this call who are, who are in philanthropy, we tell people to speak truth to power. We can speak truth to power without consequence. If our boards are behind us, we don't have a mayor or our governor to have to report to at the end of the day. And that is powerful, more than all of the money that we have. Coca-Cola spends $4 billion every year on advertising worldwide. We don't have that in philanthropic dollars. So it needs to be our voice and our, and our willingness to get dirty, get out of the skybox and get more on the field. And we have to make some, some real changes to how we engage in policy decisions. And don't be so afraid to get down there and be political. 
Wow, this is incredible. I did say this is going to be this is going to be the sh the session of this symposium, and I think I was right. You guys have been amazing so far. I want to dig deeper because I want the folks who are listening in, who are in the foundation space or the CSR space or anything related to really get down to the how, how is this done? So I wanna come back to you, Chantel, and then to you, Todd, and I think then we'll go to Sam. I want to know what is, the, what would you say is the catalyst? Um, not sure if catalyst is the right word, but um, how do you get movement and traction on the kind of change you're advocating for? How essentially, how did it happen within your organizations? Because you're gonna have uh, foundations and, and corporate bodies where you have maybe two staff members who are thinking this, but they don't know how to get it to leadership and get it to the board and let, talk less of having the organization take a stand. So what's the magic sauce? I'm not gonna call it a catalyst. What is that magic sauce that makes, um, creates that movement? that you have experienced in your organization and Todd has also spoken of? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have the magic box. If I did, I think I'd bottle up and sell it and retire uh, somewhere on an island. Um, but <laughs> I do have some thoughts for sure. I, I think we're in a space now, and you know, I ask, we've been asked the question, and, and Tullis challenges us all the time, what is needed now? He asks all the time, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What is needed now? So when I, when I take that internally and I think about what we need now, we need, and we've seen it, don't get me wrong, it's, it's there, it's just, we just need more of it. We need brave, bold, and courageous leadership, right? These are terms that, you, you know, they may be different to everybody who's listening and even the panelists, you may have a different definition of what those mean, but usually, and Todd has alluded to this and Brian very passionately spoke about this, is it, it usually means facing fears, standing up for what's right, respecting others' opinions, having integrity, serving others. And that, I could go on and on with that list, but those are some key things that you think about. Then you think, well, as funders, what does that mean to me? Well, we have to be willing, as Brian has said, and he's put a challenge out to all of us, to, to encourage and lead these uncomfortable conversations. But not just the conversations, but the conversations have to create change. Okay, I, you know, we've talked long enough. It's time to make a move, as Brian has said. You know, whether it's it's advocacy, changing policy, changing minds, changing hearts, changing the vernacular, it doesn't matter. We need to start having these conversations that lead to change. So when funders think about this, you have to be you have to stop pushing nonprofits to fit to your mission so they're chasing dollars, right? You need to find out what the needs are and be willing to fund the things that aren't shiny and pretty, right? I've said it before and I'll keep saying it again. It, it, is, it is what we've got to do as funders. The nimbleness that we've had, the flexibility needs to continue. We need to figure out how to fit it within whatever our funding priorities are. So I would, I would challenge nonprofit leaders to learn to, to advocate for your employees, right? You don't see it enough. They come to you and they're like, oh, we can shave things here. We can lower it here to make you make it more appealing to you. It's, it's not about us. It's about you fulfilling your mission. You can't cater us and fulfill your mission at the same time. It, it's just not feasible. So nonprofit leaders need to advocate for their employees. And those that serve on their board should offer to be allies in that advocacy, right? So funders tend to scrutinize when we get the budget, how much the staff are paid when it comes to the nonprofits, right? We look at it and I'm not saying that sometimes it's not warning, you shouldn't look at it and pay attention to it, you always should. But I also pose this question at the same time, it's okay for corporations to woo top talent with great salaries and benefits based on the demands of the job. So why is it not okay for nonprofits to do it? How do you expect to move anything forward if you don't have the talent in place to do it? And you hear corporations talk about the talent all the time. I mean, look at the NBA. You're not going to win championships with a bunch of C-level players. It's not happening. And the only way you're going to recruit that talent is by giving them the incentives to be there and to want to commit and to want to be part of the team. It's the same thing in the job market. It's the same thing for nonprofits. So we have got to start changing our mindset and empower these nonprofits to advocate. And then we need to be their allies in that, in that policy and be able to support them and help move that forward. Great. 
Thank you. Todd, I want you to weigh in here. I'm just enjoying all the NBA analogies. I mean, between Brian and Chantal, I've, I've, I've gotten a bunch that we can use moving forward. I mean, they're terrific. I still don't know how Brian will do in that one-on-one -on -one game, but we can explore that later. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, terrific points all around. I mean, I think, you know, when, when you're talking about this and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're building on it, the, the foundation at which you're going to approach things um, is most important. That, you know, uh, yes, crisis breeds innovation. That's how I started. But the reality is the ones that responded had a good foundation to be able to respond during this time. And that starts with who you are and, and, and your values and, and your purpose as an organization. And this, this is applicable to business. It's applicable to nonprofits. It's, applic it's applicable to local government entities as well, as well as our federal government. Like, what are you trying to achieve overall? Who are you and how are you going to go about doing that? If you're true to yourself, you can build the tactical and strategic plan to do it. But ultimately what happens a lot of times is people are being are reacting to what's going on versus taking a step back strategically to understand who they are and what their values are. And, and that's not easy. I mean, when you use words like being purpose-driven and being values-led, it's really good to say, it's not hard to, to, to set it up. What's hard to do is to live by those values, right? And what I mean by that is, then Chantal brought this up, that if you're gonna say, we're, we want people to use their voice and you hear, voices internally saying, well, we're not doing that. You need to listen to those voices, right? You need to make sure those values are part of who you are holistically, not just what you're pushing out there externally. And I think that's a big piece that's going to be true. If you want, you know, Brian brought this up. If you want to be on the field, you got to be true to yourself. You got to be ready for that. And that means being, be, knowing who you are and knowing how you want to respond, right? And in this day and age, everybody responds very fast on social in terms of how they want people to perceive what they're saying. But what I really want to see from organizations and what we challenge ourselves to do is, are we aligned? Are we impactful? Are we authentic to what we're saying that we're going to turn this into action? And we're going to live by these values and challenge ourselves during all situations, both internal situations as well as external. And you know, to Chantal's point, if, you, if you're preparing yourself and you have the resources to do that, and you have the vision and the values of knowing who you are, you're going to be a lot more ready to kind of deal with the process. It's, I always say it's not, it's not the outcome that's important. It's the process, right? If you get to an outcome that's successful without a good process, that outcome is usually very fragile. But when you have a very strong process and you get to an outcome, usually you're going to achieve the outcome you want, or you're going to learn a lot along that journey that's going to help you achieve a greater outcome and impact moving forward. So building that process and that foundation starts with values, right? On top of making sure that you're preparing your organization to be able to handle those values and driving forward your mission. And that to me is something that we as, as a community need to kind of take from this pandemic. We all have seen the inequities. We've seen kind of the things that need to get done. Are we gonna be brave enough to make sure we stand by those values and bring it forward in the work that we're doing and live by those values in terms of how we operate as organizations? Really good questions. Um, I wanna to pivot to Sam because you know, you know, we're talking here about becoming advocates for the organizations we partner with, the communities we partner with, listening to them, pulling them in, having them really share authentically about what their needs are so that foundations can then shape programming against that. Now, the end fund is focused on NTDs and we all know that the NTDs largely affect people who are not typically seen, people who uh, typically don't have a voice uh, and are often, um, you know, people in, in communities that are highly impoverished. You know, that's part of why the advocacy on these diseases is, is, is just so low. And so how do we take this conversation to that community, which you support, and what are some of the, the and I, you know, so for funders like yourself who are supporting those communities, uh, which are largely in Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, how do you give voice to them? How do you partner more equitably with them? And how do you address this issue of the voicelessness as you fund the, the, the diseases that um, tend to be prevalent in those communities? Thank you, Kudo. I mean, I, I, firstly, let me uh, support, echo everything that I've heard from, from Chantal, Todd, and, and Brian here. And as I was hearing the comments, um, 
I think getting back to your earlier question about how, how do we get traction against this kind of change that we all want to see? I was connecting the dots between e each of the comments that we heard. I mean, I think Chantal's comments speak so profoundly to how we need to show up as individuals, the kinds of you know common values that that we should should have and should you know really drive the nature of our engagement. But a natural progression, if we do that well, then we start to create the kinds of conversations that Todd started to to talk about that are needed in terms of approaching things as genuine partnerships, identifying shared values, shared value, shared impact. And you know we we can't do that authentically unless we're showing up in the right way. Um, so I'd, I'd just echo that and maybe join the dots of those two comments because I, I think you know what Chantal said can fuel what Todd said there needs to be more of right these authentic partnerships, which in turn I think can fuel what Brian was saying. You know if we want effective policy change, we need data, we need examples, we need you know our, our and this gets to our voice. You know our, we're strength in numbers, right? You know we we need. Um, effective demonstration of how new creative types of partnerships uh, can deliver this kind of change. And we need to take that and make a new case to policymakers to, to make the kinds of changes we need to see in government. Um, so I, I appreciate all of these perspectives and you know, they're, they're reminding me of, of so many public-private partnerships that I've seen being successful within the uh, global health sector, uh, utilizing the, the platform of sports and music and these sort of common denominators that really create community. And they, they, they teach us values, they teach us concepts, they, uh, they help us support one another and and from that i think so much can develop um, but you asked another question about you know what what we're doing to um essentially try to give a voice uh, to the hundreds of millions of people I said before who are not accessing the treatment they they need and so when it comes to global advocacy um, i think first and foremost um a, a, a common response, to you know the, the the challenges, the fragility of the system that we've talked a little bit about. Um, you know, I mentioned the recent UK uh, decision to to cut its funding. Um, rather than necessarily everyone in the sector responding with their own perspective on what that may or may not mean, coming together as a global coalition to say, look, you know, here's the impact of this, and here's what we need. Here's what the the communities who are affected by NTDs need. Actually, the building blocks are already there. They just need to be put together in new ways. We need to approach the problem differently. Um, you know, these are things that we can do as institutions and through these partnerships. But perhaps coming back to the, uh, the individual choices uh, and, and strategies that we can be putting in place, uh, you know, ourselves and as organizations and teams, I think centering the narrative that we are, are telling either our donors or our partners, other stakeholders, centering it around the experience of those affected by neglected tropical diseases, by COVID-19, by whatever it is that we're talking about, um, centering the narrative around those stories and ensuring that the mechanisms we put in place to tell those stories are as proximate to the people and their experiences that, that we are trying to represent as possible is, is just critical. This is a journey that the, the end fund is actively on ourselves as I know all of you and many others are. And so, you know, the more we can share uh, our own perspectives, experiences, and, and I would come back to um, even the in, your introduction, Akuda, of, of Chantel, uh, you know, welcoming difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations to get to the root of this. I mean, that, that's exactly what we need to be doing more of to, to ensure that we break, uh, you know, in our in our sector, you know, we we use the term neglected tropical diseases, and unfortunately, the the term neglect affects so many facets of the work that we do and the the lives and livelihoods of the people that we try to serve. Um, but you know, we can change that, and I I think perspectives from private companies, perspectives from you know global voices like the NBA, perspectives from philanthropists like you know De Beaumont, who is, is deeply engaged in local communities. We need to be coming together to have more of these kinds of conversations and ensuring that 
you know, we remind each other that it's okay to have these uncomfortable conversations and reminding each other that, you know, here's our experience and, you know, here's what we need from you as much as, uh, as anything else. Thank, thank you so much, Sam. So I want to start to, cause you know, we've, we've gone around and we can see that uh, we're advocating for almost a radical shift in the way that funding agencies line up their uh, funding against priorities. So what comes to mind for me now is rolling this up to the global level uh, and, and you know, taking a close look at what happens at that level. You know, we spent years trying to come up with the current 17 SDGs. Prior to that, at the turn of the millennium, we spent a, a number of months trying to lead up to the millennium with the eight MDGs at the time. Um, so these sustainable development goals against which, you know, foundations don't um, ignore them. Uh, private sector does not ignore them. They do determine um, how we line up funding. So what do we do with the SDGs? Do we throw that out? Um, do we uh, have a, an annual check-in to rejig it? Or what do we do? Um, with the global systems of prioritization that then lead to alignment of funding. Does anybody want to take that? Um, if you, anybody interested, Sam, you're nodding. Do you want to? I, I'd be happy to kick us off and, yeah, and look please. forward to contributions from the others. I mean, I think the SDGs are what we have. They are a um, globally recognized uh, framework. They are relatively comprehensive. There are obviously lots of sub goals beneath each of the 17 SDGs that, um, you know, uh, fairly appropriately, appropriately represent a, a whole host of uh, complexities under each one. Um, but I think one of the uh, SDGs that is talked about the least and that is the most important is 17, and that is partnerships. Uh, and so I'll come back to, to some of the um, uh, elements we've discussed today around the importance of, of shared value and integrating, uh, uh, integrating approaches for, from different communities. Um, yes, it's helpful to have the other 16 SDGs to you know, rally communities around, to create a common language uh, you know, or to, to use to speak about issues. This is very important. And you know, to a large degree, this works for, for many uh, advocates and fundraisers. Um, but unless the interdependencies and the, the, the nature of how um, each of the other 16 SDGs relates to one another, is recognized and is held at the center of our discussions, we're not going to truly have the most productive conversations. We're not going to, to Todd's point earlier, we're not going to create the most value, valuable and value-centered partnerships because we're each going to come at things from a different with a different agenda. We're in a different box, a different, you know. So I think the more we can look recognize the importance of laying things out in a framework, of course, but the more we can talk about and identify opportunities and shared value in how the SDGs speak to one another and how tackling one can help to tackle others, um, only then are we really going to start to unlock the, the value of, of the kinds of partnerships that the world is, is going to need. I mean, with neglected tropical diseases, as just as one specific example, they are called out explicitly in an SDG 3.3. But by virtue of tackling NTDs effectively, you are uh, making valuable contributions to SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and, and the list goes on. So um, you know, I, I think, you know, that's just one example, and there are many, many more, even uh, less, less uh, obvious links, um, like the, the growing threat of climate change, um, you know, and, and how that affects water bodies throughout the world and disease transmission. I mean, these things are all interconnected. And, you know, we, what we need, we, yes, we have a comprehensive framework in the SDGs, but we need more of a comprehensive community behind them uh, to be able to speak to each other about how we can support one another. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Um, you know, I, I think you're, you've hit something there. Uh, it's almost as though uh, folks who are prioritizing the SDGs should also prioritize the linkages between them uh, for effective uh, 
uh, implementation. Really, uh, standing in silos is just not going to work for the world we've moved into. Any other comments around the SDG question? No, I'll, I'll wanna... jump in real quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. I'll go after you. No, no, you go ahead, Todd. I'm good. Um, I, I was just going to add on to what Sam said, because I think Sam hit the, hit the most important point, which is the interconnectedness between everything. And I think Brian brought up that point at the beginning. We talk about health, health inequity, talk about economic inequity, you know, th those in power make the decisions. That is certainly the case globally. Um, and it, it makes it very complicated. What I would say about the SDGs is, and I would agree about this, I think Sam said it more eloquently than I'm going to say it, which is they don't reach the masses in a way. I mean, we talk about it within our circles, right? Um, and we're aware of it because we're living and breathing this work and are passionate about it. But how are we going to get this work out there to others? How are you going to make this more actionable for people to understand that, yes, the, when you talk about your environment, think about how conscious people were of their environment during the pandemic, wearing masks, staying home when they're sick, being mindful of what they touch, cleaning surfaces, right? Not touching their face. All of these things are interconnected with the environment that interconnects with the, the economic pieces and the health and equity. It's all one piece. And when you create this big roadmap, you lose people. And so, you know, I, I think the roadmap is helpful. I think we need to figure out a way to pare it down and get some simple points out so people understand and can and can figure out ways to engage with it on a very personal level. And I and I don't think the Millennium Development Goals or the SDGs have been able to do that. Now, this is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and I'm not saying it's going to be done overnight. And, and, you know, nobody has the exact answer, but we do have to simplify some of these things, knowing that if you want to go deeper, the information's there. Because I think even making sure people are more aware of them and understand the interconnectedness, the importance of partnerships, how, how all of this really plays into what they just went through with the pandemic is we'd be missing an opportunity to really talk to people when they're most impacted by these things. You know, I think this is the first time when people are really feeling it on a very personal level, but certainly have seen it on multiple levels where what are they going to take away from this experience it is, is kind of the, the points of the SDGs in general and that interconnected some partnership piece that Sam really hit on. And how are we going to boil that down so that people can really interact with it is going to be very important. I'm coming at it from a business and marketing standpoint of how do you reach people with a wide message um, and how important that is and how, you know, you're, you're talking about when you're thinking of a global nature, it's going to be different everywhere. There's not a universal map for everybody, right? We're all different. And so, but there are similarities and philosophies we can bring. And so that is one focus I'd like to see is how do we boil this down so that it's more simple for, for everybody to understand and what they need to focus on. And when they need to go deeper into those ideas and partnerships, they can then do so without having to see this overwhelming kind of plan that maybe is hard to relate to on a very personal level. And, and the other thing I would add to that is both Sam and Todd talked about partnerships. All too often, we look at partnerships as a tactic rather than an outcome. You know, there were any number of health officials in the U.S. who had to go meet with their business community for the first time to say, we're issuing a stay-at-home protocol. We're closing you down. That's a bad first date, like no matter how you slice it. And so you need to make those partnerships an outcome. You know, we, we have something called the Build Health Challenge, and it is, it is agnostic to disease or outcome. What we really want is the community's picking what their issue is and then building those partnerships between hospitals and community-based organizations and the health department. And what, I'm, what I hope lasts from that is that collective multi-funder or multi-sector you know, multi collaboration because that's what's going to drive change. And so when there's a, you know, the next problem that comes up, they go back to that partnership, right? Because I mean, Sure, we can pour money into diabetes or we can pour money into heart disease, but they all have the same basic, you know, social drivers of those diseases. We need to put the partnerships together to then actually, you know, change our communities, not just focus on a disease. And this is an evolution that boards need to make, right? Because everybody wants to say, you know, we lowered diabetes rates in this community by 7%. That's good. But what about all the other stuff that's wrong with the community? All the other challenges they're facing. Have you built the human infrastructure 
right? Like we have the infrastructure bill happening in the US, we'll build bridges, we'll build roads, but the human infrastructure are those partnerships and those relationships. And sadly, we neglect them or we've even become very tribal in those partnerships now. Uh, you know, for us, like say, I'm working with Frank Lunds because Frank knows how to talk to conservatives and I know health. And so together it's the peanut butter and the chocolate, but that's what we have to do together. And we need more of that funding, that development of human infrastructure and human connectedness will get us further down the line of where we want to go. So can I just say a kudo really quickly, just tie us together. We're not going to be able to build those partnerships without blatantly having some serious straightforward conversations, right? Let's just be candid. Institutional racism has an underlying theme through everything we've discussed here today, and we need to be able to say it, put it out there, and then talk about it. And I'll take a a term I've learned from a museum friend of mine who is a director at a museum. We can't build partnerships until we create gracious spaces to have the conversations. And I don't mean safe spaces. I think that's an overused term because in today's current environment, a safe space for me is not going to be the same as it would for maybe Brian, Todd, or Sam, right? So if we create a gracious space where people are allowed to misstep and have some make mistakes and maybe say things that might be offensive sometimes, but to try to create an understanding and a conversation that moves change, there's no way we're going to be able to do partnerships without creating that space, building the trust first of that foundation, and then being able to move forward from there. Because as a black woman in America, I'll have to say I walk in a lot of rooms. I don't see people that look like me and sometimes very uncomfortable to have conversations but I've taken upon myself to challenge myself to do that. And then until we're all willing to do that and be a little bit in a lot uncomfortable, we're not going to move anything forward. And it has to start with addressing institutional racism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chantel. That's such an important point. Thank you, Brian, for the previous point. I think we're all speaking so powerfully, so authentically. And I think people who are listening in are taking notes because now, this is what change is all about. It's about being authentic and really going to the root. So I want to thank you all for, for really being so honest in your call. I do want to make sure that I give everybody a chance to make a closing point, a closing uh, remark as we round up our beautiful time here together. I've learned so much. I've been um, stretched and empowered and pushed and, um, you know, there's been a lot, you know, I think my thinking has been provoked, which is excellent. And I'm sure our viewers feel the same way. So I want to go around um, and, and give everybody a chance to give a closing point. And in fact, you know, feel free to work with one another and pull in one another as you, you make your closing point. It might be that your closing point is that you have a burning question for somebody else on the panel uh, and you want them to, to bring that up. So um, I, I want to go around, and I'm going to start with you, Brian. Um, why don't Why don't you start, and then I'll go to the next person. Over to you, Brian. So I'll, I will be brief. With the philanthropic sector has for a long time been very comfortable with charity. What we need is change. We can, you know, every GoFundMe is a monument to the lack of systemic change. I need money for a funeral. I need money for my healthcare bills. Those shouldn't be questions in our nation. They are because of the decisions that we've made. We need to reckon with the fact that many of these 500,000 deaths from COVID were preventable. And the reason they occurred were because of COVID, but also for a long history of decisions that we've made. And that's our challenge going forward, not charity, systemic change. Thank you, Brian. You know, I'm gonna ask you to pick the next person. Uh, I, I will, I, I'm going to let Chantal kind of be our cleanup. So Todd, I'll, I'll go to you next. I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, I, I'm going to build off what Chantal said. And I think, you know, knowing who you are, knowing your values allows you to have that space to have those conversations. I think there needs to be a time, and this is the time to really reflect that mirror on ourselves as organizations, as businesses, as philanthropies as public sectors to really kind of have that difficult conversation of what are my values? What do I want to achieve? And and where am I today? Right? So much so everybody's so worried about their reputation externally without really kind of taking a look at who they are and knowing that if they go about things the right way, 
the reputation piece will take care of itself because they, they don't have to they don't have to go about it in a way that's not authentic. And that has to happen. And, and we're at such an inflection point right now where we all have an opportunity to do that with our organizations. And regardless of your role, push for it. And I know we're talking to a lot of leaders here on the phone today. Make sure you give space to have those conversations regardless of the level or the people in the organization and how important that is of listening with humility and approaching this work. Um, because if we don't, we're going to miss an opportunity um, during a really devastating time to make everything better. And so lead with your values, listen, and be authentic to who you are. Thank you, Todd. Todd, can I ask you, thank, thank you for that. I'm going to go to Sam. I'm going to go to Sam, keeping with the okay. order. All right, go for it, Sam. Sorry, I come off mute there. Very hard to follow that uh, because I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with everything um, thus far. Uh, you know, I, I think um, if the change that uh, Brian said is, is to come, we, we need a common language to use. Uh, part of that language, the foundation of that language is our values, is how we show up uh, for and, and to one another. Um, and on top of that, we, we need a common language to uh, create new incentives in the system. There's so much of the, the system of how global health is funded, uh, you know, and, and that's in the, the U.S. as well, um, is stagnant. It is, it is built on systems that are unsustainable, uh, that are inappropriate, that, that are, are just, you know, they're not going to serve humanity uh, going forward. And so if we're to change that, we need a common language. And I think, you know, companies like the NBA have such an important role to play because they are, they represent common values. They represent community. They represent, um, you know, I, I think a huge opportunity, not only to, um, to demonstrate values, but to help to create the kinds of spaces, Chantal, that you talked about the, the need for. Uh, and so the more that we can leverage, um, you know, these common platforms, these common voices and, and you know, influential voices and brands uh, to help, you know, support that common language that we need, um, you know, the better. Thank you, Sam. Over to you, Chantal. So I think in, in closing, we need the groundswell, right? And I think it comes from the communities. And the communities first have to define in, in what we look at the post-pandemic, resilience and recovery are two key words. But we as communities have to define what that looks like, and we need to push that up. It needs to come from the bottom up. This is not a top-down approach because all of our communities are different. So create the groundswell. We need to define our communities, what the lens looks like for both resilience and recovery, and know that's going to take we the people. And when I say we the people, because before they didn't include everybody, I'm, I'm aware of that. But when I say we the people, I mean funders, nonprofits, business, government, federal, state, local, et cetera, have to come together and create what that looks like and then be willing to get out of our silos and take our egos and put them to the side and move toward a greater purpose in recovery and resilience post this pandemic. And be prepared, like Brian said, for what's next. Fabulous. Uh, you know, with that, there isn't much more a, a moderator like myself can add. I think our, our distinguished speakers have done an excellent job. I think you've, you've left it all out. You've um, given us your very best, ending on these really strong and important themes of the need for change, uh, the need to lead with values um, and to lead with the heart, um, the importance of agreeing on common language and pulling together um, common voices and, and, and powerful voices to the table to, to share that common language. And finally, you know, this sort of radical approach to determining what resilience and recovery means based on the communities we come from and how diverse they are and the need for government, private sector, communities, um, and everybody to come around and to determine collectively what that looks like and to prepare for it, as Chantel rightly said, to prepare for what is next. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, and you know, philanthropy is leading the charge in so many ways. So it's my hope that um, what you have shared here today will be heard uh, by your, your fellow colleagues in the philanthropic space. 
And you know, we will be developing a white paper based on this symposium, which we will share with all of you. And the intent is that this will influence how we move forward post pandemic. So with that said, I wanna thank you all for your time and effort, both during this session and in all the weeks of preparation leading up to it. And uh, from Texas Biomed to your institutions, we're grateful for the collaboration and the support, and we look forward to more. Have a good afternoon, uh, evening, uh, based on where you're located, and we'll see you again soon.